we're back. We're back up here on the stage, the very lovely and sunny corner of Glenwood and Lunt. We're at the Heartland Cafe. Every Saturday morning, we bring you another edition of this, this program, and you can always look at it on WLUW.org. No, excuse me, you can listen on WLUW.org, but you can watch it at YouTube.com slash Heartland Media. And uh, that tune was called Irene. Uh, some of the lyrics are a little challenging for a dad, but uh, that's uh, my son, Cadian Lake, and his, his brothers, so to speak, in the band Twin Peaks. Uh, they'll be doing a tour going out west now they're all graduated. And uh, we'll see how that one goes. They're going to do a 10 or a 9 city tour in a big old bus or a van. So, wake up, Katie. Graduation Katian. present there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Many years ago, when I was a young community organizer, I came upon uh, uh, some activists over in Humboldt Park. Uh, one of them was a guy named Obed Lopez, and uh, he was a, a firebrand then. I actually have photographs deep in the archives of you being arrested by some police at one time. And, uh, <laughs> Usual practice. <laughs> and uh, I got an email from your brother. Omar and um, he uh, he told me about this uh, history project of the Chicago Latino Coalition 2020 and a program that's happening today and an exhibit Division Street 1966 a beginning <clears throat> and Carol Lee who I knew back then too uh, she was an, also an organizer and got to know Obed and I guess you guys have been hanging out ever since <laughs> and we're so glad I think the last I've probably seen you a few times since but I remember you showed up when Mezcla from Havana showed up here. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was a wonderful occasion, and I'm sure they're doing well down there. Um, so who wants to start off and tell us about this program that's going on today and this, uh, this photo exhibit? Oh, well, we wanted to um, let you know about an activity that we started uh, with a group of people who've been active for many years coming together uh, it includes organizations as well the Latino Coalition 2020 um, but the idea is that we want to look back to look forward and uh, the first you know event of the history project will take place today actually it's the launching of our history uh, committee and, and project uh, that will look at the era from which we, uh, you know, began. And that was a very important point in the development of the Puerto Rican community in particular. In June of 1966, uh, there was a three-day um, period of time when the community itself just spontaneously rose up. Uh, I'd like to have Obed talk a little more about that particular time and when he was uh, witness to those events in June 12th, 13th and 14th. Well, what I can recall is the fact that uh, that uh, fateful Sunday, people had uh, celebrated the first Puerto Rican week on the first March on State Street. So there was a feeling of happiness I think that's the only thing you can say. And within this context, in the afternoon in Humboldt Park, some of the police officers, I don't know if they thought that perhaps we were getting too happy or what, <laughs> but they just uh, clubbed and heard one young Puerto Rican. This happening in the middle of uh, general celebration caused uh, the media the reaction and people without any kind of uh, prompting from any leaders because we could say that at that point there were no actual leaders in the community they just began to respond and uh, the response well they had to uh, make use of the only thing they had on hand and that was stones so they used that weapon to fight back the police that at that time especially was totally unconcerned about the Latino community. And generally very abusive of the yeah. young people. No, I remember, uh, that was my first summer back in Chicago. Uh, I'd been up, I'd been in Chicago the summer of 64 in Uptown and then I went out to Berkeley for a year and a half uh, 
and I came back, I was working again in Uptown with Joint Community Union, and I got to know you uh, shortly there after or around before, but I remember uh, that was the news, that there was a rebellion out on Division Street. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that probably uh, encouraged uh, a lot of community organizing. It developed organizations. Uh, the Latin American Defense Organization. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Latin American Defense Organization. Was it already in existence or was it started as partly a response to this uh, rebellion? Well, actually, what uh, people like myself that had uh, already a progressive involvement because we were involved in 1961 with a, commu with a Cuban community in Chicago through the 26th of July movement and later through the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. We're uh, going way back here. <laughs> oh, yes. That, uh, um, you know, we were active at already at, at that time. So when uh, this incident in the summer of 66 took place, we just felt that somebody had to do something and uh, there, were nobody, uh, there was no other group around so that then we went to move on. There was a group called the Spanish Action Committee that had a connection to the Archdiocese of Chicago, the Catholic, through the Catholic organizations in the Spanish community, like the Knights of St. John. But again, they did not have the, their reaction to the to the rebellion was more of trying to contain people and trying to bring them down so that things would remain as they were. Uh, let's hear a little bit about what's going on with the program today. Um, you've got a number of guests. The event is uh, today, June 9th. It's 4 to 6. It's at Casa Central Auditorium, 1335 North California. And uh, one of you tell us who will be there and what people might expect when they come to be a part of this event. Well, the main speaker will be Dr. Samuel Betances, who uh, was a resident of the area at that time, and he was already a, a professional. Um, when uh, the city had to respond to the demands of the community, um, Richard Daly, the old, you know, the old man. Senior. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, chose him to be the director of the first urban progress center. That was the first uh, agency, city agency, that began to provide direct services in, in that area. We also have uh, Dr. Luis Tony Baez as the master of ceremonies. And he was, a, a, again, he's another one of the uh, Puerto Rican uh, professionals, intellectuals, that also responded and want to come back and um, make a recollection and analysis of what has resulted from you know, that period. Also on the program will be the street poet, David Hernandez. Ah, Many of David you may Hernandez. know him. Sonidos de la calle. <laughs> yeah. So he's there and um, Yolanda Nieves will give a presentation as well. Besides that, we have a lot of young people coming up in the community. We want to honor and to uh, help in any way we can. And the uh, young orchestra of cuatros, the typical uh, instrument of Puerto Rico, those students will perform today, and one of the songs they will perform is one that was written right on the spot during the disturbances on Division Street. It's from a, a Jivaro music, uh, the sounds of the countryside in Puerto Rico, and the, this was a way of communicating fresh news. And that song was written right then and there on a 78 record, which you had to turn over in the middle to hear the end. <laughs> Uh, and that was played on the radio and more people came out of their houses and from Indiana and from other parts to come and find out what was going on in Chicago because of programs like yours on the radio the, that really responded to what was going on in the streets. Well, I want to thank both of you for coming on the show, Obed and Carol. 
Um, can you tell us briefly how people could contact you and a little bit about the history project of the Chicago Latino Coalition 2020? Okay. The history project uh, is like uh, we say a beginning. We're not nostalgic but we are looking back and in a very methodical way we want to bring the lessons that were learned back in the day and bring together people throughout the city to figure out what we're going to be doing next and uh, we'd like to have anyone who's interested in going back to the history in the in the Latino community in the uh, Puerto Rican community especially to contact us and uh, the website is Chicago Latino 2020 uh, at gmail.com. So that we could do. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. And we'll see you more often, I hope. <laughs> okay. okay. We're going to get our buddy Alan Gomez up here, and while we're, uh, we're making the transition, uh, I want to have Tom make an announcement about an event coming up. And I would like to just say that uh, off of what Carolina and Obid said, uh, you know, it's, uh, we want to know where we're coming from. We also want to know where we're at, and we need to know where we're going. So looking at these historical uh, pictures today and hearing some stories about what went on in 1966 will give people who are active today a little bit of a perspective about where we're coming from, help us get clear on where we're at, and have this vision of where we're going. Thanks a lot. Hasta luego, compañero. Gracias. All right. Next up is Alan Gomez. Tom, give us a little information about your upcoming event. We talked earlier around the NATO Summit about uh, messaging and, and the communication challenges even in the Internet age and getting that messaging out. Uh, this Thursday, June 14th, the Community Media Workshop will be having its annual Making Media Connections Conference at Film Row Cinema at Columbia College. It's a day-long event featuring our most popular training workshops in the morning, a keynote address from uh, the marketing director for LinkedIn, which is a lot more than just a professional job search service these days, and afternoon panels and an evening reception, breakfast and lunch included. Call us at 312-369-6400 for more information. And tell or you can go to communitymediaworkshop.org. And what is chicagostories.org? Is it Chicago still Stories, we are keeping up. That is our repository of 20 framing stories with sources talking about why Chicago is the fresh coast, the crossroads city historically for 150 years where there's lots of good stuff going on. More trains go through here, more trucks go through here, more airplanes go through here. Second city, nah. It's probably the, center the, of the chief universe. internet hub of the United States. Aha! <laughs> well, okay. Um, it is good to be here at the Live from the Heartland show every time I bring this guy on. Uh, Alan Gomez has uh, been around for a few years. He's uh, told us stories about stuff going on down near 18th Street. He's talked about pirate radio stations in Honduras and other places. And uh, most recently, I got an email that uh, there was a communal living arrangement, a group of people celebrating an anniversary. And I don't have those details. But that's why I said, Alan, come talk about communal living. And he let me know that he was in town. He filled me in a little bit later that he's been down in, in Chaco, Chaco, Colombia. And he'll tell us about that. So let's just hear whatever wants to come out of his mouth. How are you, Alan? I'm doing really well, Mike. How are you doing? <laughs> You're looking good. Thanks. Thanks. You too. You've you been back to Ecuador ever? Or? No, I've just been in Colombia this past year. And it's been, uh, it's been a pretty amazing experience. Um, just to backtrack a little bit into the, the communal living thing, um, about 10 years ago, actually 10 years ago, uh, we started a cooperative house down in McKinley Park. And it's still going strong. It's, uh, it's, pretty, it's been a pretty educational experience on a, on a number of different levels. A lot of things that you know, communal living or intentional living uh, offers is that kind of next step forward. You know, it's like, oh, if we, ma if we manage to, you know, change, make dramatic changes to the way the system operates, what would that look like? Well, a lot of it would look like, you know, hopefully consensus, process, having um, intentionality uh, in all the things that you want to accomplish. How many people? This, is, this one is a small house. Stone Soup overall is three houses. Stone Soup? Stone Soup. Yeah, that's the name of the, the cooperative. Uh, this house is seven people. We used to serve that here, Stone Soup. 
<laughs> yeah, you had to bring your own ingredients, so. Yeah, you bring your stone in. And <laughs> it started in Uptown, in a church rectory, right? Exactly, exactly. It started there, and um, but uh, each house has its own uh, its own dynamic and its own uh, autonomy under the the kind of uh, guiding principles, you know, of intentionality and consensus uh, for all the um, for all the houses. Well, since you're always traveling around the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, what's it like when you were there? At, uh, at Stone Soup. At Stone Soup. <laughs> Are you uh, actually a resident of Stone Soup when you're in town, or were you? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I've lived there for. I mean, I I helped start that house on the south side, or well, I was one of the uh, original members of that house, and um, actually today we're celebrating the 10th anniversary. Um, and uh, but I've lived in that one. I've also lived in uh, one uh, up here in uh, in Uptown, and uh, you know it's. <laughs> It's really great. It's a shared experience. You know, I think it would be very challenging for a lot of people who are used to kind of... Uh, um, Having their private space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you have private space. It's not, it's not honestly, it's, it's not that radical in, 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 in many senses of the word. You know, it's, 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 just, it's just intentional living, shared spacing, you know, and, uh, and sharing resources and also reducing your carbon footprint, you know, reducing the excess that living in your own kind of cubicle or apartment or all these other things kind of generates. Well, we hear all the time about kids uh, moving back in with their family and, uh, you know, given the challenging economic times that we're experiencing and certainly many people in the world have experienced for a long time and even more so than us, for sure. Uh, what's the status of this? Uh, is, is communal living or collective housing or... Uh, you know, is it, is it having a resurgence or an expansion? Are there more people doing it? Uh, either of you guys, uh, what do you what do you hear? What do you know? Well, honestly, I wish I could speak more to it, but I've literally been away all year. <laughs> um, I do know that uh, a lot of people do come, particularly uh, our cooperative, a lot of people do come with the notion that uh, communal living is something you do in college, but then you graduate into, you know, uh, staking your own claims and so forth. And debt. Uh, and debt, exactly. You don't, you don't, you don't buy the house. You debt. don't buy the house. You buy the debt usually. You know. But one of the things that uh, that our house in particular on, on the south side, and actually Stone Soup overall, kind of stands uh, apart from many other types of uh, cooperatives, is that there is a wider age range. There is a wider age range of people who are looking for an alternative to that status quo kind of a living scenario. So, I think it. It kind of stands apart in some of the uh, some of the examples that I've seen, but it's not unique. Uh, I've seen it in in many other places, many other cities. Um, is it growing? Is it not growing? Unfortunately, I don't have my finger on the pulse uh, overall t uh, to be able to. I think tell it's that. quieter, but but maybe more influential in part because of economic pressures. Mm -hmm. uh, my move from the suburbs in the city was into a commune, and it was from folks who came out of Pilsen and ended up in Juneway Terrace area. Um, that lasted for about three or four years. We actually bought a two flat in Lakeview at some point. But as one moves further out of college and family start and whatnot, I think it becomes more challenging because the greater society really isn't encouraging this kind of stuff. But there's one trend that I think is related to particularly the multi-generational aspects of intentional living and that's co-housing. Um, which I'm sure is not the way Stone Soup sees itself. Um, but as someone who's getting closer to the retirement side of my uh, career, this is something that my wife and I find a lot more appealing than the, the uh, even the two flat with a granny apartment above it, uh, which might have been a more traditional way that a form of extended family intentional community living t would take place. Um, the co-housing concept is that basically you have multi-generational, uh, your own units, but part of, uh, depending on the physical space, part of a, a bunch of houses around a courtyard or an apartment building that has a common kitchen or, or other meeting room space. I think the biggest challenge, Alan, and I'd be curious in your experience with this despite all your travels, is that um, uh, consistency over time as people's individual lives and careers come and go. How do you maintain that consensus decision making, shared resources, etc. How do you maintain that over time? Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously going to be a challenge. I mean, it is something that for many people in this, I mean, I think almost from like the moment that you enter kindergarten, you're kind of like programmed to be very individualistic, very, um, you know, stake your own claim, you know, it's kind of, probably has something to do with the whole uh, 
you know, go west, young man, kind of mentality of uh, conquering land here in um, in the U.S. history. But um, honestly, the the way that those of us that have kind of done it for a considerable amount of time has been is just uh, finding the rewards and actually working in, in uh, collective spaces. Um, it's actually helped shape uh, personally for me, you know, like the type of way that I work collectively with other individuals and beyond housing, you know, on projects like the one in Colombia, projects like the radio. <coughs> the radio project, uh, building radio stations around Latin America, it's like having that kind of intentionality, the consensus process. It really is, once you, once you really get invested into it, it becomes kind of the language you speak. And, 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 I, and I mean that not just verbally, you know, but in the way that you interact with other individuals.